Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Pamela Edmonds, and I am the senior curator at the McMaster Museum of Art. And I thank you all for joining us this evening for this special conversation between myself, curator Mona Phillip, and exhibiting artist Nicola Feldman Kiss, whose exhibition Scapegoat is currently on view in the museum until March 18th. Uh, it's a very moving, uh, powerful exhibition, and I do hope that those who can visit uh, can come and experience it in person. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking today from Hamilton, Ontario, which is the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee nations, and within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. I'd like to also express gratitude to the generations of Indigenous people and communities for their care of this land and the teachings uh, about this earth and our relations. At the MMA, we recognize the colonial role of museums in the imperialist project and how besides presenting and interpreting objects of cultural significance, how our spaces can also be and represent historic and ongoing trauma, theft and difficult histories that persist in the privileges of the university and within the traditional collecting practices of our institutions. And so uh, it's our responsibility to respect indigenous ways of knowing and to work in moving towards uh, and moving forward in a spirit of partnership reconciliation and collaboration through honesty, empathy, and action. Uh, so thank you again for uh, being here, for your presence, to share in this conversation as we move through this moment of profound change and challenge. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the MMA staff and supporters for their assistance in bringing Scapegoat to fruition. It seems pretty unbelievable that the work is actually up in the gallery after so many starts and stops. It's been a, about three or four years uh, since we first spoke about presenting um, Nicola's body of work at the museum. And uh, since the global pandemic, this exhibition really has taken on an especially prescient tone and significance. Uh, this talk has been set up as a webinar, so there'll be an opportunity for a Q&A around the 45 minute mark for the last 15 minutes. So if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And we'll try to get in as many as we can in the time allotted. Uh, I also wanted to let the audience know that we'll be recording this session uh, for the museum's YouTube channel. Uh, so I'm going to uh, skip reading formal bios. We have uh, limited time together. So uh, for any details and descriptions, please refer to the exhibition materials on the McMaster Museum website. So thank you again. Welcome, Nicola and Mona. Let's begin. If you want to queue up your video and your hi. Here we are. Here we are. Here we Thank are. You are. Hi, Mona. <laughs> Hi, Pamela. Hi, Nicole. Hi. All right. Thank, Thank you, you both for, for the me. lovely introduction and, and thank you to the McMaster and everyone there for organizing all of this. That's my um, pleasure. You know, thank you so much to McMaster for um, patience and perseverance. <laughs> And uh, and for helping um, me to uh, to to uh, install a very beautiful and chilling and moving exhibition. So gratitude to McMaster team for that. Thank you to you as well. Um, so okay, so let's start. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, you, Nicola, for a, a, the first question. Uh, you've spoken about your artistic activity as a performance of witness with Witness being the title of your survey exhibition at the Ottawa Art Gallery in 2015. And your exhibition Scapegoat is taken from two bodies of work, which you started in 2015, uh, sparked by the need to respond to what you refer to as a collective 
sociopathy in America and one burgeoning in Canada during the contentious Trump era with the rise of white nationalism, anti-immigrant sentiment, a lack of accountability to the police brutality and state violence against black and brown bodies. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the pandemic has really intensified this longstanding divisions between race, class, and privilege. And during the pandemic, these, these death tolls have become part of our everyday existence as a lot of us are struggling with this, um, a different sense of freedom, of movement, of this overhanging sense of grief and loss and, uh, and coming to terms with colonization. Um, and, and this unprecedented sense of global vulnerability. So I'm interested in how uh, you unpack these issues from your own personal histories uh, and beyond. And so can you speak to this idea of witnessing as it relates to your practice and how it led to the series that evolved into Scapegoat? Sure, thank you for that um, really easy first question. <laughs> <laughs> Not complicated at all. Um, thanks, Pamela. Um, yeah, in 2015, I did a um, survey exhibition with the Ottawa Art Gallery, and we pulled together 15 years of work, basically, and to kind of use that 15 years to try and draw together a coherent narrative. And because I work across disciplines, um, the narratives, which are extremely consistent in my work, aren't jumping out they're not obvious they're not necessarily formal um, other than my um, adventures with technology and my curiosity that way um in uh 2000 and late 2009 2008 9 i started winding down a project that i had been working on called childish objects and um that body of work was um you don't know as much about excavating my childhood and learning about the roots of my curiosities and dysfunctions and ways in which um, as a person, body, child in Canada, I um, experienced certain cognitive dissonance um, between sort of like the grassroots everyday banalities of life and the rhetoric about what Canada was and is as a place of acceptance and multiculturalism and diversity and equity and same-sidedness. And I guess I had got to a place in my life where, you know, a certain maturity where I started to realize that some of what I thought my country is and had been was not. Um, and I kind of relate to that moment as a kind of growing up. And um, becoming like in the Susan Sontag um, way, um, coming into moral adulthood. And in order to come into sort of moral adulthood, I felt like I needed to go and look around a little bit at what the world actually was. And not just, you know, travel and see places, but sort of dig deep into the stories mm -hmm. that we hear on the news, the stories of far away, and to try and unpack a little bit about sort of the information culture we live in and the reality that we live in. And that's what really gave rise to the idea of witness. And the last project I made in the Childish Objects series, which basically has consumed, um, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 or 15 years of my life, um, and um, was a project called The Camera Eye. And um, at some point when I realized I was, um, I was leaving the investigation of the child childhood and looking more outwards, that piece became, the camera eye became a bridge piece between looking at the world and looking inside myself. Um, mm. <clears throat> so it became the camera eye brackets witness. And oftentimes in my work, I have kind of complicated, long poetic titles. So mm. that work was the, was the bridge piece. So Scapegoat is really the first body of work um, post that major survey. And, um, and the last piece I had done in that uh, in that project um, of witness was a a synthetic um, speech recital of a database of um, worldwide um, battle related death tolls, 
and mm -hmm. it's really long. It's, I don't know, three and a half hours long. It just drones on and on and on because it's a synthetic voice. It doesn't have breath. It's a bit chilling and sharp and tinny and very far away because I'm using a kind of speaker that's about being very far away. So when I finished with that piece, kind of started asking myself, well, who are these numbers? Like these numbers, are they, where are their names? Where are their bodies? And because my work is really so much about sort of how our spiritual beings are manifest with materiality in the body, I really started looking to embody the death toll statistic. And mm. this gave rise to Pieta and scapegoat. Yeah, you often uh, do these durational performances that kind of meld the, the boundaries between art and life. And uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about your experience as an artist uh, that participated in the Canadian Armed Forces um, uh, program in the Sudan and how that led to your uh, explorations of work like the King to bodies of traveling to other spaces and, and uh, you know, shaking yourself out of this, what you call this, the first world um, privilege, being someone who's a first generation Canadian of Caribbean heritage that like many of us have multiple uh, identities uh, or multiple, you know, multiple heritage. So I'm interested in how you use this, this durational performance and um, how your experience in, in Africa led to uh, some of the issues that you're exploring in, in, in these works. Well, <clears throat> the, um, the trip to Sudan came about because I had, um, as I had explained, I was winding down, or what I thought was winding down, because it turns out it's just continuing this project called Childish Objects. And it really was sort of like, in a way, a kind of a reparenting or a, a rediscovery of myself through my ages. And um, I had arrived at this time where, you know, that 16 year old fan crush, you know, other friends of mine had, you know, the fan crush on Roger Daltrey or, kiss or you know these rock stars i had a fan crush on um on a photographer um i'm just having a brain fart now <laughs> south african photographer who had been photographing the anti-apartheid movement and uh and had photographed um in sudan as well and so i had this early fascination with um with conflict journalism photojournalism mm. And, um, and so it dawned on me that maybe this was the time now to explore that former urge that I had, um, that I had basically gone in a different direction. When, when I went to university, I thought I was going to be a photojournalist, but then I got into the art program and I discovered that, you know, this, this really was the place for me. Um, so, uh, so the easiest way for me to perform that former self what and the the safest way for me to perform that former self was through the Canadian Forces Artist Program. So mm -hmm. I'm, you know, a long time kind of an anti-military and anti-armament person and um, and an equity person and also um, um, it was very uncharacteristic of me to decide to embed myself in a sort of military humanitarian project. It was sort of dissonant with my values. Um, but that was uh, part of it for me. Part of it for me was to go into a certain tension and dialogue with my moral center and, um, and allow myself to be open-minded and open-hearted and vulnerable to the experience. So I really did want to perform this um, kind of, you know, traveler, adventurer, an adventurer with a camera. But it became complicated because first of all, the Canadian Forces Artist Program had not embedded somebody in an African project uh, before me. And also I was uh, interested in performing Peacekeeper. And mm -hmm. 
and so I had pitched that they send me to Sudan because Sudan was the only place where there was an active conflict and also a peacekeeping mission already established. And, um, and, uh, and Sudan was the site of a photo by Kevin Carter. It's Kevin Carter, the photographer, who I had on a crush on as, as a teenager. And Kevin Carter had made a photograph of a vulture hanging out in the background at an internally displaced persons camp with a starving child in the foreground. And um, after going to Sudan, I understand that photos like this are sort of here and there and everywhere. It's, um, if you're allowed to take photos, you can take photos like that. Um, but the world uh, was, um, was shocked with that particular photo because even though in the actual scenario it might not have been so, but it looked from the photo like the vulture was hanging out waiting for the child to perish so that the vulture could get its next meal. So there was just a kind of a very, you know, uncomfortable co-location of these two elements within the image. And that image never left me. It, it got a Pulitzer Prize. Um, Kevin Carter got a lot of world backlash for being behind his camera and not feeding the child. And there was many, many controversies and stories that came out about that photograph. So I went to the site of that photograph um, with the Canadian forces. And a person like me with an, uh, so much multiplicity, the, the Caribbean, the Jamaica, like out of one, many, it, which is the motto for Jamaica, this is a perfect kind of descriptor for people like me because I have so many ancestral lines and so many um, cultural heritages, so many to the point where I almost have none, um, because right. each one right. is 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 um, you know a, a thread. Um, people like me and my family, they were all uh, they 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 teased us that we were the UN. You know, as bodies, as individuals, we were the UN. So going to a peacekeeping mission served the served my need not to be in an active, you know, military context, and it also served this sort of childhood projection of of the sort of identity multiplicity that the UN mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And I learned lots of things from there, things that, you know, realities about the world, realities of what, say, a UN mission is. At the end of the day, the UN mission is a mission. And um, mm -hmm. I brought home these realities and they, and then I started looking for them in my everyday and in my, you know, local context. And I found that sometimes it's easy to see things in faraway cultures that we don't fully relate to because we're sort of self-othered from the environment. But once one knows what they're looking for, it's easy to see it here and there and everywhere. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, scapegoat is really so much about um, about embodying the lessons of Sudan. I wonder and, if if you yeah. can maybe in relationship to the piece we're seeing on the screen, um, if you can talk a little bit about how. I mean, from, from everything you're saying and from the work you do, it's clear that research and active research on the ground, um, you know, in all the situations you can experience directly um, is very important to your work. Um, but I think it also, it doesn't remain on the level of, of journalism or research, you know, with detachment and, and distance. Um, you take your body in these places, you put your body in a certain um, way of experiencing um, the world, life, everything that happens. And the goal, as you've mentioned, sometimes it's, it's um, an act of radical empathy, right? So I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, maybe using this, this work about um, the trajectory from, from witnessing to empathy? When I returned from Sudan, I was there for a little over a month. Um, when I returned, I realized how I had been sort of suspended. I spent, I spent the month and a bit in a state of probably minor dissociation. Um, my experience there was very much like a movie, like as if I was in a virtual reality. It was very hard for me to hang on to that. It was sort of like a palpable reality. And um, 
And the way I coped with that was being very much about my devices and stealing. I, I traveled under a photo ban. Um, my, my visa was issued under condition of photo ban. Um, I still made thousands of photographs, but I started to real, realize how my apparatus was, in fact, a kind of a defense mechanism to the context. So when I got back, I started to experience the flood of emotions, most of which were really, really hard. Um, and I made work from that really, really hard emotional place. And once I had finished a few um, artworks from the experience, I wanted to... I wanted to experience a masquerade. Um, I wanted to have a kinesthetic sense. I had the, I had a bit of, um, um, I had some foreshadowing and some brushing, some intense brushes up against events while I was in Sudan. And I wanted to take that experience a little bit further. Um, but I was a little bit worried about myself, so I didn't want to go back to another war zone yet. And um, so to experience a mass grave, I found um, the international supply chain of osteological specimens. And at the time, I was under sort of a delusional belief that osteological specimens would be a little um, less... Um, um, laden than an actual mass grave such as Rwanda or Austria, Germany. And, um, and so I went to India and I went twice, first to, um, first to introduce myself to the person who held the largest cache of osteological specimens in India and then back again to develop our relationship and i was hosted there for uh w with this gentleman businessman for for two months but i found i found that opportunity because i had done some work with some documents were leaked to me while i was in sudan documents that they were for, for the reports and forensic evidence around a massacre in a town called kaldak kaldak payam village and um and the photos in the report concerned an, a, a calamity that um, was sort of an encounter between rivaling factions that sought 254 dead in a single afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, I, the photos I received showed skeletal remains completely desiccated and dry um, in the desert. And um, I was struck by how it wasn't so abject and gritty and icky, and I surmised that was because the bones were dry. Um, the carrion and birds of prey had really done their work in 11 days. It took 11 days to reduce the bodies to bones. So I started looking around on the internet to learn more about what the desert does to, to human remains. And I found an opportunity to buy a set of human remains. And that was a very uncanny gesture for me to make the decision. So I found the opportunity, I made the decision, and I went into a layaway arrangement with the seller, which was a Canadian seller. And um, it took me three years to acquire the set. Um, I got the box in the mail, Canada Post. I kept the box for six months and then I started my research about the supply chains while I had the bones in my possession, but unopened. So I did my research prior to opening the box. Um, the adventure of going to India to penetrate the supply chain of, um, was um, very typical of my, of my process. I basically had a uh, documentary, um, some documentary evidence and, and, um, and news articles. And I took, I took, I took the written materials and used them as a, a guide, a tour guide. And I followed the roots of the, um, human, the market for human <laughs> remains. And I went to some of those places. And mm -hmm. so to me, going to those places, article in hand, like a tour guide was very much about simply checking your references online. So it was another way of doing the footnote, but rather than going to the source of the knowledge it, on,
paper in words, I went to the source of the knowledge in feeling. So I could, I could know this embodied because for me, my best knowledge acquisition is when I feel stuff. I'm a feeling, sensing, channeling person and experiential research is what drives my work. And as I've learned that about myself, I've pushed my body into some extreme places in order to be able to create from the feeling knowledge in my felt sense. So here I am, I'm sitting on this um, pan and chain beam balance. The piece is called Scales of Justice and I'm in meditation with my weight in human bones. Um, Shit. For me, this piece is about a lot of things, but the most important thing it's about is the privilege of being born into a Western existence. And you also talk about the the materiality of the of the bones relating to ancestral history as well. Like, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about. Um, about how the Pieta works relate to, I mean, maybe we'll go Sorry. back because uh, I want to get to how this particular series, the initial aversion to the flight of the sufferer um, was an extension of um, how different narratives, how different bodies are engaged with um, pos different positionalities, specifically in Toronto, um, you're focusing on a local community and did a casting call um, for this series, which I think is, a, is, is very much about intersectionality and very much about unpacking um, various identities and so i'm wondering if we could maybe talk about that first and maybe go back to the sound work sure um well one of the things that i learned from my experience embedded with the united nations um is that there's a certain caste of people who populate who populate the military and who did the fighting on behalf of the nation states and um and also where the fighting occurs so i started to ask myself who who are a enemy what is an enemy combatant you know who who is eligible to be an enemy combatant these are words that we hear in the press what they do. we don't really know what they mean they mean sort of anything that you know we can imagine in a way and um and and who are these people who um who are so easily disappeared and who disappear into the numbers that we, who by the time the numbers get to us they've already become disembodied and depersoned and sort of disposed of and um um scapegoat was a call first around people who identified with the color brown second of all identified with trauma um, people who identified with leaving every everything behind stuff friends family ancestral lineages 
to start somewhere brand new? And who are those people who came in hope and what did they encounter? And when they came in hope, did they encounter something hopeful? And what I encountered is people who came in hope encountered a lot of systemic challenge. And yeah, so the, the men who have put themselves forth to participate in this work are people who identified with the poetry, basically. It was a piece of poetry that I had posted in the casting call section of Craigslist and Kijiji. And I had a process to for them to get to know the work and a process for me to get to know them and for us to get to know each other and to know whether or not we, A, wanted to co-participate in the work and if we could feel safe um, sort of improv taking on this extremely weighty emotional narrative together. Um, there are pro uh, approximately 27, I think, photos in the whole series. Um, and this scapegoat is the last of the work that I have done. So with each of these, um, with each of these series, I've exposed a little bit more of the individual um, model cast participant and also a little bit more of my own vulnerability as the, um, as the, as the image maker. Um, scapegoat, well, and the whole body of work, an initial aversion to the plight of the sufferer is all made in collaboration with men who live in Toronto. Some of them born here, um, most of them having arrived here after they were born. <clears throat> Each one of them is in the piece because they related to the story that they saw happening in the piece. Each one of the photographs is an extremely intimate performance. Um, there are, are a lot of kind of, there are a lot of tensions in this work. Most, for me, mostly the, you know, I go, most of my work has to do with photography in some way. I'm always unpacking something about the camera, about the, 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 the model photographer relationship, about the power relationship that is inherent to the, to the photo studio, the portrait studio, um, whether it has to do with gaze or it has to do with somebody doing and somebody being done to. So, mm. so we've worked very closely together in, you know, the, extremely sensitive kind of um, space to create this work. But they also, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, go no. ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say that the works also have this sculpt sculptural quality as well, because they are light boxes. And I feel like they uh, um, take on almost like this uh, cinematic, like this sort of, presence of movement you were talking about edward um mearsbridge about how you know they they have this sort of kinetic uh linearity and when we were installing them you were saying that you didn't want to have any of the um of the men or any of the of the images um the viewer not to have their back to any of them, which I thought was, you know, a really cognizant way of uh, orienting the space where, you know, um, one has a sense that these, these images are being presented um, as a monument in the sense, you know, that they are about um, honoring the stories of those all of those uh, subjects who are all named um, in in the work, but then the 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 skeletal set is a collective body. It's not as you understood it, and you you did the research. It's not one individual, but it's a collective um, body. So it 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 it's really kind of not about one particular identity, but about a broader conversation about multiplicity it's a, yeah it's about difference or sameness at the end and where we decide to start the story um i'm very preoccupied with this idea of where do you enter the story you know where do you enter history what happened before that but what happened before that and then what happened even before that so 
Um, these bones, you know, when I found them online, I was extremely struck, dumbfounded by the fact that I could buy a foreign remains of a foreign person because when I bought them, I thought it was an individual. And, um, and I understand now as a lay person that leading me to believe that they were an individual was part of pulling at my heartstrings. It was part of the transaction in a very, because I'm very preoccupied with the uncanny and I will always start burrowing into that, which makes me feel uncomfortable because I want to get to the root of that discomfort. Where is it in my humanity? What is it that I'm surprised with something? Is it, is it that I'm, you know, encountering something for the first time or am I counting something that's so deeply familiar that it's calling me in? So, um, so these bones are a, a set of specimens and they come out of the medical supply chain. And I, began to recognize that as an artist, I had a kind of um, association with them. But if I had been a medical person or an anatomist or an osteo osteologist or an anthropologist, I would have a very different kind of relationship to them. And what I did learn is that we do have different types of relationships to, to human bones and human remains, depending on our contacts and, 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 and where we're coming from. So whether in subcultures they're deeply spiritual and deeply energetic as they are in tantric cultures, for example, in, uh, in some cultures there, you know, should never have been, um, um, disinterred, whatever their disinterment, um, might have constituted, but in some cultures they're around, they're, they're around and they're not as abject. Um, so yeah, I, I realized that I was working a with when I realized I was working with a collective body, but I'm also working with a collective set of approaches and knowledges and responses to them, and um, and and this openness, um, they became a very open sign for very many things, and they are remains, but they're also a. Um, well, an aesthetic sign and symbol and, and also a prop and an index, a photographic index to a whole bigger story, like how it is that, you know, in Canadian law, I don't, I can't, I don't actually own my body. There's nothing I can do to enforce any particular doing to it once I'm dead. Um, but I am in a position to own the remains of somebody else's body and somebody else's body that didn't even originate in Canada and we can't own bodies that are Canadian bodies and it's not Canadian bodies that we use as osteological specimens in our medical research programs. So they're full. Mm -hmm. These bones are extremely full and, and, and able to indicate a multiplicity of reads, political, spiritual, material. Mona, did you have your, did you have a question that you wanted to, to add to that? I have many on my okay, mind. I'm sure. <laughs> um, I wonder maybe just to kind of follow a, a train of thought that will lead into, into um, next works. Um, I think it's, um, it's quite interesting how initially you started from you know, in, in, in the work you were producing some years ago, um, your individuality was sort of the, the, the subject, the central point you were working to, you were working against active erasure and, and you know, claiming space and, and, uh, and presence, um, you know, with the work that, uh, that you title, I absolutely know I exist. <laughs> Um, and looking at um, but your presence in the world and how it is perceived. And here you enter a space of relation where you're, you're creating a relationship with, um, with others you bring into collaboration and, and producing work together. Um, so I wonder how, how that shift works for you and how um, you use the notion of the gaze, which you mentioned um, was of, of central interest to you um, to create that relationship, not just in the production between you and, and the people you work with, 
but also in how the work then affects and implicates the viewer. Mm. Um, well, I didn't start out working with my own body. I started working, I started out working with the body. I've always, I've always done work around what actually is this thing, the body, you know, and the various transitions that we go through from, you know, um, I, I was pregnant as a very young woman and while I was in art school, my first child was born while I was in art school and I had the early art school days to process what is a pregnancy <laughs> and you know a pregnancy is something gets done to your body it's sort of like oh and then by the time you get used to it being out there it's suddenly not there anymore and um and that sort of set the stage for it and I spent the first kind of my art school days and grad school days photographing other people and also making sculpture referencing the photographs and um, when it came to my work Mean Body, which I began in 2001, I had myself scanned with a 3D scanner and or I had the idea to get myself scanned as in a, and, and, and digitized. I wanted to digitize my body and I, um, I spent, you know, a year trying to find that opportunity. So in order to find that opportunity in 2001, I had to embed myself in a science context where they were, so I could penetrate the network of people who were creating those tools. Um, and so the project that came about from that was Mean Body. And that was sort of my first major transition because now I was putting myself up for the gaze, the steely, cold, rational gaze of the scanner, which is a measurement device, so it was a it was a, a very deliberate and um, and uh, sort of pointed conversation with Edward Moybridge. I was very interested in his sort of pseudo scientific presentation of these eroticized but pretending not to be eroticized bodies, and I wanted to kind of make a piece and dialogue with that. Um, so uh, so the. The, the many works over seven years of production that came out of that um, body scan data, I, um, I was working with my own image. I was working with my own shape. And, and, and it was that body of work that gave rise to childish objects because, you know, when, when working with one's own body over a very protracted period of time, there is a, like a very weird relationship to the data or to you know, I'll own it to my image. I, I realized I had become sort of detached or, 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 or dissociated from the image of me and people like me who work with the body. You can hear us, we have something in common. We all call it the body. It's obviously our bodies, but we all call it the body. Stellar, Marina Abramovich, big people. They, we all use the same vocabulary. So I started to consciously recognize that I had kind of dissociated from this likeness of myself. And, um, and, that, uh, and that pushed me into a much more personal, intimate dialogue with my, you know, sort of psychological self and my spiritual self. And it wasn't until I was sort of done with that process that I felt kind of enabled to image somebody else again. Um, you know, uh, I kind of, as if I got bored of myself, like I did my story, I did a thorough excavation of, of me and I kind of come to the end of, you know, my fascination with my own self as a topic. And, and I, I relate to actually that work as being kind of a, a decolonization of the self, which, you know, somebody else might call therapy or, um, you know, psychoanalysis. And, um, and, and I did a number of works that were really about sort of undoing some of the sort of social, socio-political, um, cultural, contextual impacts, like, you know, my education, for example, all the stuff I was told and not told. You know, I don't think I was, as a, as a learner, as a student, I don't think I was assigned a single reading by a person of color until I was in grad school. And even then I could, you know, count them, you know, within a handful. So um, there were other things that I needed to know and other things that I wanted to learn. And I needed to, you know, 
learn by looking outward again and, and going into the world and to start discovering this thing which was empathy um you know empathy over identity so um, so nicola you were you were exploring scapegoat which you kind of referred to as a closing in a way and then siren the newer work as an opening and you're moving from kind of very like a grounded earth uh conversation into um an engagement with with water and with notions around that so i wonder if we could talk a little bit about siren because in the last few minutes before we get into the questions do you want to do that um yeah absolutely um that whole period of work that I did between 2010 and 2019 was very, very difficult work. You know, the awakenings that came out of that research were hard. And, um, you know, awakenings about what our system is a holdover from, you know, a supremacy state. And, um, and how I had sort of naive, naively believed that the sort of broader collective or society was a natural flow from the individual. And what I really learned is that individuals are diverse and um, come in all shapes and sizes, of course, but also types of people. And I really kind of equate um, people to maybe more like, you know, Breeds. I'm, I'm not a big proponent of race categories because I think that they're destructive in terms of, you know, um, 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 compassion and um, and collectivity and um, and solidarity. In any case, I needed to put to bed some of the work that I had been doing around conflict and devaluation and disposability of people and bodies and 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 and, and cultures and groups. And, um, and turn towards something br bigger and broader and a little bit more um, joy producing. And uh, Siren came, um, came about quite accidentally and, and I have an incredible pull to the ocean. Um, my parents are both from the Caribbean. My dad arrived in the Caribbean and my mother was born there. And um, I spent a lot of time as a very little kid um, growing up, learning to swim in the ocean, hanging out for months of the year with my um, with my families as a very very small child, um, in like in the preschool days, and I've always kind of had a personal sort of mermaid alter ego, and I was also a competitive swimmer as a child. So all of those influences have gone into me saying, okay, if this work has now become too hard and I need to close it because I really did begin to over-identify, I, um, I said, where is my, where's my next passion? The thing that actually really feeds Nicola as a person. And so I, I followed the My Mermaid call um, back to the ocean, uh, but because I have um, since Sudan a, uh, a commitment to working locally, um, I, I did my ocean explorations here in Canada and, uh, sorry, I just need to plug in, and, um, and started investigating our oceans. And so I first went to the Atlantic Ocean um, because the Atlantic Ocean is the site of a lot of passages. And so I, you know, um, I've been asking myself a lot about, you know, what's what's happening now that we have, you know, um, internet and news comes from everywhere. We know a lot more about what happens in the Mediterranean and we can imagine a lot more about what happened in the Atlantic and the transatlantic. So I so, yeah, I, I started thinking about, you know, what the water is and what the ocean is and um, and about migratory culture and migratory species. And I started thinking so much more about the earth because once I started discovering the geology of Newfoundland, I started to realize that even the rocks are moving, the butterflies are moving, the winds are carrying seeds, the ice is moving. Everything earthly is in a migrational flow. And um, once I realized how this sort of fractal nature of earth and us earthbound creatures 
it really opened up my thinking to so many things. And then the piece Siren features an iceberg, which came about kind of completely accidentally, but we really tried to get an iceberg, but we had not planned to get an iceberg. And the, the um, underwater movie shoot that I did off the coast of Newfoundland in the Atlantic during the first COVID lockdown, um, which is Siren 3, um, it's a it's a cusp for me. So so everything scapegoat initial aversion to the plight of the sufferer ended in in twenty nineteen, but it sort of ended by trickling out. And then Pamela gave me this opportunity. Actually, Pamela asked me specifically if I would pull that body of work together, and Mona specifically asked me if you know to work to, to with her um, with, with Siren. And so scapegoat is now a closure it's done it was done in 2019 but you know with gratitude to mona i've used this COVID period to pull it together into the sort of monumental thing that i had always envisioned it was but didn't necessarily feel like i had the internal um sort of fortitude to carry to completion so i'm really grateful that Pamela has been able to hold space for a lot of crazy difficult emotions that I have encountered going through it. And Siren is really interesting because it really shows the effect that the whole Pieta body of work took on me. The coincidence of my personal life story that happened while I was producing the body of work and then Siren is coming into a whole different reality and as siren is just finishing right now i'm still very curious about what it's what all it's going to take on um it's but it's very much a journey right it's the mm. piece itself kind of parallels the journey that you've been doing kind of sinking to some very dark places um doing a lot of introspection and 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 reflection and exploration um mm and encountering, re rediscovering uh, a lot of light and, and, and will, you know, for, for um, survival and, and rebirth and, and reinvention and coming back to light. So maybe we can, we can look quickly at the, at the video, which is still a, a sketch, not the final piece, um, yeah. but just to, to give the sense of how um what the, yeah. you know this is a new beginning but you're still you're you're kind of concluding a whole meditation on the notion of witness um mm -hmm. where there isn't any more your there's no body present anymore the camera is the witness which actually the way that i think you intended it and the way i perceive it as a viewer puts all of us in the position of witness, puts anyone who's watching um, this piece in that, in that position of, of witnessing, of being, you know, of being the one experiencing the drowning and rebirth, um, being welcomed by the sound um, that is very important. Um, so maybe we can watch and you can, you can talk a little bit about uh, the structure and, and narrative of it briefly as a conclusion while we're afterwards or while afterwards yeah let's watch a little bit and then okay. a little bit and then we can do the q a yeah okay
So can you can you talk a little bit about how based on the sketch what the final piece uh, turns out to be? So 2018 I went out to um, 2019 2019 2019 I went out to be a guest uh, in residence at the Pooch Cove Foundation in uh, just a little bit north of St. John's. And I believed I was going to Pooch Cove to do research about a drowning scene. And the reason a drowning scene is because I have uh, been um, an organization that I follow closely is called Sea Watch, which is a, um, they do rescues in the Mediterranean. They're a, a charity that rescues migrants from the Mediterranean. And they had an encounter with um, the Libyan Coast Guard who's uh, paid to keep migrants out of European, off European shores. So um, the result of the encounter, the open water encounter with uh, between Sea Watch and the Libyan Coast Guard would result in a number of deaths um, where it just seemed like the Coast Guard was actually purposefully drowning people, purposefully permitting people to drown and pitching stuff at them and definitely not being helpful and interfering with the work of Sea Watch. And I watched it as a news clip. And during that news clip, I felt a huge well of needing to put my hand out to this man who was just within arm's reach of the edge of the Coast Guard boat and right there on the YouTube clip drowned in front of us. And being a swimming person and a water person, I had a tremendous kind of feeling of, um, you know, impossibility to act. And uh, I wanted to make then a piece about empathy from the perspective of that individual man who had drowned in front of me through the internet and that gave rise to the drowning scene but you know in my personal life I was also dealing with a lot of challenges and I was also asking myself you know why I'm so fascinated with the whole drowning thing and when I was in Newfoundland and I, I worked with um, I worked with a uh, uh, a diver with a camera and I worked with a remotely operated camera also like a drone camera that we operated from a, a from a truck uh, and it was on a tether and ultimately I worked with the, with the divers. Um, I realized during this particular shoot that um, that a, dr a loop, if I wanted to make a loop which was a drowning scene, it was yes a drowning but it was also a rebirth and it was an ascension. It was all of these things of we think about um, you know just sort of the descent and the ascent and uh, that was a very important moment for me. So when I made this, like my whole project shifted from a drowning scene into a cycle of life, a call back to the waters from whence we all came and, uh, and then a return to the light um, at the same time. And now with this video, this is really just, the, this was the pitch piece. I mean, I, this was my fundraising document and what we're missing in it is, well, everything, because the final Siren 3 is just about 13 minutes long. And what's between the drowning and the coming back to the light is this entire underwater scene, jellyfish, an iceberg passing. Then we leave this sort of video underwater iceberg environment and we find ourselves quite suddenly in a completely animated and digital environment and I think about it as a meditation that I'm bringing somebody bringing the audience through um, I've wor really worked extremely closely very collaboratively with my crew and my team and um, and the edit is this edit is is um, I'm working with Caroline Christie who's an amazing documentary film editor and um, 
and uh, yeah, so it's very much about the transitions. It's very much about being creamy. It's very much about, you know, are we having a hallucination or is this a, something really happening? I'm playing very assertively with the various like um, types of space, whether it's above the water, under the water, digital, and so on. Um, yeah, so it's... Uh, Maybe we can see a bit more images of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because we're, uh, we're, we're at our eight o'clock mark. Yeah. So, so I thought that we would maybe start with the... I saw a question had come in. And yeah. uh, you start to talk about how you find your collaborators and singers uh for your video that was a question that came in so i thought maybe we'd take another 10 minutes and and go over the uh if there's any other questions please put them in the chat but would do you want to answer or or just address that a bit more uh nicola how you uh work with your collaborators or the singers yeah that Lisa, are... if you could go back to the ship photo the first siren that would be great um yeah. In 2018, I was invited by Artspin to do something on the um, Toronto Island because they were doing a tour with um, the Kajama or Kayama tall ship. And I created this performance. And um, I had been invited to do a sound installation, um, I think, because I'm known for working with these very specific speakers that are a little bit like, uh, like, like uh, spotlights only rather than like a beam of light coming out it's a beam of sound and the idea was to project sound into the ship where we would be able to then have a sort of one-on-one -on -one sonic relationship with the individuals in the ship now it was a really beautiful summer and i was busy at a friend's cottage composing with loon sounds that i had you know as culling from the internet i was collecting this, you know, open source data of, of loon sounds, uh, because I hear I'm already interested in the mermaid. So I'm trying to think about um, what is, um, what is uh, the sound of a mermaid and what is the mermaid in a, in a context of the on Lake Ontario shoreline in Toronto. So that's where the title siren came. And I was thinking about emergency. I was thinking about climate emergency, migration emergency, moving people out of war zones. Um, and uh, there was a lot of people on the move. I'm thinking a lot about statelessness. I'm thinking about settlement culture and who are these people and who, where did they come from? And again, where do we start the story? So when did people start being on the move and start arriving? So I made the leap from the loon sound to the uulation quite naturally because I really didn't want to be inside of my computer. I wanted to be outside. So I thought, well, the best thing for me to do would be to work with vocalists. And in my family, we have lots of lost cultural practices, lots of lost languages. And um, I've always been extremely attracted to the uulation because the uulation is throughout Africa, Middle East, and it seems to follow a migratory path, a migratory path that is familiar to, to my ancestors, my ancestral um, passages. So the women um, came to me because I met one woman who I knew worked with her voice and I said I was working on this project and now I had this idea and, and that was Valerie Buhajar and she said, oh, I can uulate. And I'm like, great. So we got one. And, um, and then, you know, um, I also inquired at the Arab Women's Association and some immigration settlement charities looking for people who had who were recent arrivals and who wanted to come and play on the island with us and um i yeah uh various i had i put feelers out in various um in various ways i uh the um people who worked with me also work with the element choir um i worked with uh rula saeed who is um, a, a known vocalist in toronto and miriam taller another known vocalist in Toronto and um, um, Layla, an art historian. So once I started finding people, people started finding me and, um, and, the, and the group has grown. So we're, we're nine, we're nine women who have been gathering to ululate and to create um, vocal sonic data for me to compose with. And for composition, I'm working with, um, with Michelle Irving. 
And of course, this is the beauty of doing this in Toronto in the local context, because you found uh, women who come from all these different cultural contexts and different types of relations that you were able to, to, to mesh together and, and combine into a collective sound. Yeah, the idea of like, you know, ululation is a very deep old practice among, you know, uh, throat singing, maybe it's related to throat singing also, these vocal, feminine vocalizations are as old as language. And, um, and each culture, each village, everybody has their own practice of ululation and it means different things some people some some cultures you late in 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 celebration it's simply it's like applause like it's a rival it's send off um some cultures you late in mourning wailing um grief um but more and more ululation is such a giant emotional release that it is really tied to the status of women at any sort of time era, political time era specificity. Um, so some of the women I've worked with who have been, one woman who had recently arrived from Syria had recently um, removed her hijab and to be out in public, no hijab, megaphone, big voice was mm. massively transformative to her you know, just in her experience of being able to make noise in public in that way. I've learned so much from the women who I'm working with, you know, how they are completely embodied when they're vocalizing. Um, how I work with other people so they can perform being embodied in ways that I can't. Yeah, but yeah, I, the men in Scapegoat, all the women are local to Toronto. I think that sharing of creating that um, space for commune, communion is an important part of this work. And I thank you both for, for sharing uh, in this conversation, which is very uh, timely, very important. I think we um, should wrap it there. Um, I invite everyone to come to see the exhibition uh, at McMaster Museum and to, it's up until the 18th. Um, and hopefully we can see Siren up in its iterations sometime in the next uh, while. And thank you, Nicola and Mona so much for being here tonight. Thank you, our audience for engaging and um, we hope to see you in person <laughs> again sometime soon. And thank you, Elise Klinning, uh, our communications manager for helping us uh, set up all of our tech and everything tonight. And uh, hope to see thank you, you soon. Thank, thank you to you both all. of you. Thank and you to, so much. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to work alongside with you through all this collaboration and to finally share it publicly a little bit. <laughs> same, same. Okay. Well, I thank, you, I thank you both. And I thank McMaster and um, Elise, who's working in the background to keep up with us by citing images. <laughs> um, but it's been really a tremendous joy to work with Mona and Pamela, especially together, the three of us. I have to say, this is the first time in my professional career that I've worked with people who share some of my bits of identity. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that because of that, we've been able to have a very deep conversation and the conversations that we've had over the last three plus years working together have really, strengthen the work and push the work into areas that I couldn't have imagined doing on my own. So I'm in big gratitude for that. Pleasure. Yes. All right, everyone. Uh, thank, thanks again. And um, we'll see you sometime soon. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Bye.